Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am Melinda Moulton and I'm your host. And today I am honored to have Dr. Rick Barnett with me. Hi, Rick. Hey, Melinda. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for so much for agreeing to be on my show. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, so to my viewers, I want to let you know a little bit about Dr. Barnett. He is a licensed psychologist doctorate, licensed alcohol and drug counselor with an additional master's degree in clinical psychopharmacology. He is also the co-founder of the Psychedelic Society of Vermont, and he's president, founder of the Carter Inc. Center for Addiction Recognition, Treatment, Education, and Recovery. Is that about right? That's correct. Yeah, you got it. All right. Wow, that's a lot of that's that's a lot, Rick. Well, let's let's start let's start at the beginning, which is always where I like to begin. Um, share with uh, my viewers a little bit about who you are, where you hail from, and a little bit about your 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 past. Yeah, uh, born and raised in Stowe, Vermont, where I am right now. Native of Stowe. There's not many of us here. Uh, and I grew up here in this idyllic town and found myself, uh, as I got older, uh, getting into all kinds of debauchery and alcohol and drug use uh, as a maybe somewhat of a typical teenager at that time, but maybe took it a little bit too far and got myself into all kinds of legal and uh, academic and physical troubles, relational problems, wound up in, in rehab actually at the age of 20 and spent six months in rehab. Uh, and then that launched me into a, a journey of recovery and uh, was able to finish my uh, my college education as, as, as a part of being sober and in recovery and went on to get a, a doctoral degree and another master's degree. And eventually uh, I, I had moved to New York City, believe it or not, for 13 years, lived in New York City, loved New York. I was just down there this past weekend. Uh, visiting, and uh, I moved back to Vermont in 2005 to raise my family, and and here I am. And my my career has been in uh, in clinical psychology, in addiction treatment, and uh, really more recently realizing what's happening with all the psychedelic research going on. Knowing from my past, having used psychedelics, that uh, these are powerful tools that can be harnessed and uh, integrated into people's lives in a healthy way to make for changes they might be looking for. And so I, I've been delighted that I, I was able to do a training program in psychedelic therapy and research uh, in 2020, 2021. I'm in another training for a specific kind of psychedelic compound, which uh, it requires a little bit more specified training. And I've uh, been able to work with other healthcare prof professionals to try to bring in this new psychedelic paradigm into uh, into our culture in a safe and effective way. It's been an exciting ride. It sure has been. It sure has been, Rick. Um, so my next question was going to be about what inspired you to get into the field of addiction treatment. And I'm assuming that it had to do with your own um, period in your life when you were when you were addicted, correct? Probably. That that's what inspired yeah. you to get into. Yeah, exactly. I, I I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. I got sober when I was twenty, and I had uh, already an interest in psychology. And I felt at the time, believe it or not, I felt it was kind of a cop out if I were to go from this person who was addicted to going into recovery and then working in the recovery world. I was like, that's too easy. That's too. It's too basic. Like, why would I just want to devote my life to? uh dealing with addiction when i'm what i've been dealing with myself and i've got my own recovery story but that that thinking changed because i realized that addiction is really uh something that is potentially inherent in all of us we all have the potential to get uh to develop an unhealthy relationship with our thoughts with uh, behaviors with substances and it really didn't feel like i was sort of um putting myself backing myself into a corner by focusing on addiction because it's so it's such a widespread problem. So I, I just I sort of fell into it because of my my own personal history and also my fascination with psychology, behaviors, human relationships. Sociology. And, and well, you sociology. know, it's so interesting that you were you were young, you were 20. So what was what was was your drug of choice alcohol? And I mean, at the age of 20 to make that realization that that you want to that you want to stop you know, taking whatever it was that you were taking, 
is a young age because that's kind of the party age the going off to college and talk to us a little bit about that what inspired you what what drove you to finally say you know i've had enough well yeah i mean it, it's extremely young and i'm super grateful that i was able to sort you know have the resources available to me to to get the help that i needed and and to be able to connect with people and have realizations to maintain to stay on this path because that it that's a difficult age to uh make that decision and realize how what a shit show it is to to live that lifestyle but I, already at that age i had started using cigarettes at age 10 and i started using alcohol at age 11 i started using cannabis at age 12 so i started pretty young and i you know i, I sort of off to the races by the time I was 15, I'd used cocaine, MDMA, was using cannabis on a daily basis, was a daily smoker, was really getting into alcohol. And a number of consequences just built up very quickly over the course of those five years from 15 to 20. By the time I was 15, I'd already been arrested twice. Um, and uh, so it just it just got worse and worse to the point where my pancreas basically just gave out. And uh, that even that was really the... Um, the straw that broke the camel's back because I'd already been kicked out of three apartments in Burlington. I had been arrested three times. I had been in four car accidents. I was kicked out of my family's home. I, my relationships were all over the place. So it was really my physical health being stopped in my tracks, being in the hospital for a week, recovering from acute pancreatitis, where I had that sort of moment of clarity, uh, even though I was still somewhat resistant and, and, and uh, was able to be convinced to go to rehab at that time and was open-minded enough. And I, you know, I honestly, I say this, Melinda, the only reason why I was open-minded enough to the message of recovery is because of my psychedelic use when I was actively addicted. I used a lot of psychedelics when I was a kid and there were aspects of those experiences which really stuck with me in profound ways that left me open to the message of recovery, which is, you know, it's a whole paradigm shift to go from being in active addiction to being in recovery. And if I didn't, if I didn't have an experience where paradigm shifts were actually possible, I probably wouldn't have stayed on this path. But I, I knew that paradigm shifts were possible because of my psychedelic experiences. So I've been, I've been grateful to be in recovery for over 30 years. That's fascinating. And you know, my generation, when I was growing up, we didn't drink. I mean, our parents were the drinkers and we were like, Oh, you know, they're cocktail parties and, you know, it's it's such a dumb thing. I mean, we were psychedelic users and n neither my husband or I ever really got into drinking um, because yeah. psychedelics were so much more enlightening. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, you were at the press conference that I was at uh, about a month ago, um, and it was talking about the legalization of psilocybin in this state. At that At that press conference, there was a graph which blew my mind. And I want you to talk to my viewers a little bit about that graph. And it listed all the dangerous things that some legal and where they line up. And talk to us a little bit about that graph because it was mind boggling. Yeah, that's a graph that came out of England. Uh, Professor David Nutt, who's a psychedelic researcher, drug policy expert, uh, really a f fantastic human being who's done a lot to help bring in this new psychedelic era. But he, you know, he's a drug policy expert, a pharmacologist. Uh, a clinician, he understands drugs and he understands addiction. And, and that graph basically showed that the two legal and most widely acceptable drugs, alcohol and tobacco, cause the most harm in society. And then underneath that, we in rank order, you've got alcohol causing all this harm and pain and suffering. You've got tobacco causing all this pain and suffering. And you go through all the different drugs, cocaine, heroin, cannabis, um, methamphetamine, uh, benzodiazepines. Uh, you, then we get into some of the other drugs like oh, uh, morphine and codeine, and then off down to ketamine and LSD and MDMA. And at the bottom of the chart, you have psilocybin mushrooms, which is this tiny little, tiny fraction of the population and tiny fraction of harm harms done from psilocybin. And yet, it's a class, it's a schedule one drug, you know, deemed by the federal government, like cannabis, ironically, to be of no medicinal value, no medical value whatsoever, and a high potential for abuse. And we both know that that's not true. Psilocybin does have medicinal value, and it, it does not have a high 
a, a potential for addiction. Wow. So, you know, that that was at the bottom of the charts. So it's, a, it's a really fascinating chart. It was extraordinary. And what blows my mind is when you go up to Burlington, there's there's wine bars and breweries and whiskey bars every other doorway in our in our towns. It's just it I mean alcohol is is rampant especially with this you know in the last 20 years with these generations who a lot of them have chosen alcohol as their drug of choice because it's it's legal and now and at the end of the day but um i i love that graph um anyway and yeah you the know, other you know the other interesting thing about that fact about alcohol is if you talk to in Vermont, we have this great network of recovery centers. There's all these recovery centers in all the all the different counties. Turning Point in Chittenden County. We've got the North Central Vermont Recovery Center here in Lamoille County and Bennington and Rutland. And and we have peer recovery coaches, and they have partnerships with the emergency departments where peer peer recovery coaches can go into emergency departments, help out EMTs when there's a crisis around some sort of addiction and most of the cases they get called for are not opioids. We're in this midst of this opioid epidemic. People are dying from fentanyl and opioids, but it's alcohol, hands down, that is the number one problem that these recovery coaches are seeing in the recovery centers, in the emergency rooms. So we must not forget that alcohol is a serious, serious issue in our in our culture. It really is, and it's just promoted everywhere. I mean, you can go anywhere and, and you get alcohol. So anyway, um, why I, I just want to talk a little bit about oxycontin uh michael keaton was this, this incredible film it was a six-part series about um oxycontin and you know doctors are still prescribing it and i don't know if you have any you know because that may this may not be yours you know your specialty but um talk to us a little bit about that drug and, and the harm that it has created in this country well, there's a lot to be said about that, and I would consider myself somewhat of an expert on the subject. I've been engaged in discussions around the opioid epidemic for quite a number of years with a lot of experts in the field from all over the country when it comes to this. And it's a very thorny, difficult issue. And when it comes to OxyContin, that drug in particular is so uh, well known because it was in the late 90s when there was this pain campaign, so to speak, this national uh, pain campaign to try to better address pain in our patients. And OxyContin was put forth as this non-addictive new opioid that was originally just for really intense cancer-related pain in oncology. And then it was broadly promoted as uh, a good tool for non-cancerous pain, just generalized pain, and promoted by the pharmaceutical industry in partnership with various medical organizations to try to reduce the suffering from pain people had. And unfortunately, that uh, was the precipitating factor towards uh, people getting prescribed more and more of this particular drug, and then the diversion and the misuse of it happening, and then people recognizing that it's a problem and being cut off access to it, and then switching over to heroin and which eventually led to people uh, being not prescribed pain medications anymore. And so their pendulum swung completely the other way. And even 96-year-old people with severe cancer pain or people with chronic medical conditions were being forced to come off of OxyContin because it had gotten such a bad name 20 years later. And even though we've seen a drastic reduction in the prescribing of opioids for pain, we have seen nothing but increasing deaths from opioid related overdoses and and so simply stopping prescribing opioids for pain is not the answer it's a okay. very very complicated issue so uh -huh. that's that's the role that oxycontin has played it was it's a very powerful opioid that um, when crushed or snorted uh can be and has been widely misused yep well there you have it um so talk to me a little bit about the rise uh, in mental in the mental health crisis and have you seen a rise in the mental health crisis as a result of covid yes i would say absolutely uh covid was a devastating thing that happened to all of us and uh differentially it has impacted people i mean i melinda i get six to 10 calls a week, emails, text messages 
people trying to get in for mental health care, for counseling. And I'm a private practitioner. I don't work in uh, in a, a public agency and people are knocking down my doors. It's difficult for me to find colleagues to refer uh, these people to who are reaching out for help. It's It's been never seen anything like this before. There's just not enough of us to go around. And, and a lot of that is the, uh, I think the increasing polarization we're seeing in uh, the political world, the, the anxiety people have around climate change, the uh, isolation we all felt from being uh, quarantined from COVID, using technology increasingly as a way to distract ourselves and being dysregulated by our overuse of technology. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that have all sort of come together as a result of COVID uh, that makes makes this, we, we are definitely seeing uh, rising rates of suicide, rising rates of addiction and, and opioid uh, overdose deaths and uh, people seeking seeking help. And so thank God there are new tools on the horizon, which is how how we met to help people um, shift their their functioning in, in such a way, improve their well-being. Thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about our, our children. Um, there are a lot of children um, in this country who are being given antidepressants and drugs for anxiety and, you know, Ritalin and all these different drugs, young, young people. And I'm just wondering how you feel about that, um, that if, if, you know, things aren't going, going the way that and it causes anxiety that these children are being given pharmaceuticals to deal with their anxiety. And, and there are side effects to that, that coming off of these medications can take a long time. How, where do you land on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel terrible for child and adolescent psychiatrists or uh, pediatricians or family docs who are charged with uh, the responsibility of a prescription pad and people come to them for help and their main tool is their prescription pad. And they uh, are being taught that there are these medicines that can help people and they wanna be of service and, and patients and, and their families uh, demand help. And this is what they have to offer. And I, unfortunately, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, overprescribing of kids and mis misdiagnosis and using medicines as a first tool. Uh, partly because, again, that's what they have at their at their fingertips to be able to be helpful. And so I, I don't blame them for being in that awkward position and wanting to help and and using that tool. And they also struggle with finding child and adolescent mental health practitioners or child and adolescent organizations that can approach these families and these kids in non-pharmacological ways to to use that as a tool first. It's difficult to find those tools as well, those resources. So it's really kind of a cluster for a lot of um, kids and, and their families who are struggling with these issues and for us providers to find the right balance. And, and there are like some of these stimulants for ADHD. There's a great episode of uh, the Andrew Huberman Lab. He does a great podcast and he does this whole expose on Adderall and stimulants for ADHD. And the evidence is clear. If you truly have an attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder, uh, for a small subset of these people, these, these medicines can be extremely helpful and life affirming and growth oriented. But you know, too often there's just not adequate time or tools to assess these people appropriately, offer non-pharmacological tools as a first line treatment. Um, and that's just for the sort of ADHD side of things. You mentioned anxiety, depression. Again, I think in in some cases, having these medicines available is appropriate and helpful, but uh, not to turn to them as a first line treatment always as if that's the only thing and, and not to rely upon them. And maybe also think about using them in the short term rather than simply you know, offering the prescription and then this this kid who's 10 years old has now been on, you know, right. Zoloft or uh, Prozac for the last, you know, six years when they were just going through a phase of development that happened to be particularly difficult at that time. Wait, well, you know what else doctors never look at? Certainly never ask me. What's your diet? And as mm -hmm. somebody who's had a gluten and dairy um, allergy, it affected my mood. It affected my attitude. It affected the way that I looked at life. It affected my my ability to to not be depressed. And, and a lot of times it's what 
what we're eating, an overdose of sugar, or if you have allergies to certain foods, then it causes inflammation, which can, uh, and, and that they never go there. It's always, let's go to the prescription drug. But I, but anyway. Well, well it's also, it's also, it's also what, what are we consuming? So right. when you think about what's in your diet, but what are, what, what are we consuming with our attention? What are we receiving emotionally? What are we consuming in, in, in a broad sense of the term also with our diet of, of social interactions is a, is an important so these are all non pharmacological tools that we just need to do better as a society as bringing attention to and reorganizing so that we don't take the easier softer way with just prescribing a psychiatric right. medication drugs thank you for that I I really appreciate that so I so we're going to talk about natural ways to treat mental difficult for human for human beings and let's move right into your powerful work on psilocybin treatment uh, let's explain I mean a psilocybin uh, what is this psilocybin to my viewers? And um, and uh, and so explain that, and then also talk a little bit about the the human health and well being in using psilocybin in the treatments um, for mental mental health. Yeah, so psilocybin for your viewers, most people know what uh, psilocybin is, but it's the active ingredient in what's called magic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms. Psilo psilocybin cubensis is the technical name. And uh, it's basically a tryptamine, which is a, a, a type of psychedelic drug or a, a, a molecule that can interact with the brain in such a way to produce experiences that shift our senses, our sights, our sounds, taste, touch, um, we, how we uh, experience ourselves, our perspective of the world, of other people, our connection to nature, it, it basically affects our receptors in our brain and produces an experience that shifts our worldview in so many different ways, shifts our understanding of our emotions. And uh, it's an experience that can last four to six hours uh, when ingested. And people can ingest this in various forms from uh, a, a capsule form that's ground up powder from the raw mushroom itself, dried mushroom itself, and dosage is really important because there's this whole movement around micro dosing where people take small amounts on a more regular basis versus what's called heroic dosing or macro dosing. I don't like the word heroic necessarily because it sounds like a, a challenge that we need to be heroes and and take large amounts of this stuff, which is probably not a good idea for a lot of people, at least not in a in a sort of haphazard kind of way. So there's dosage and yeah, it's a really powerful tool to help people maybe look at themselves or experience the world differently in in a way that no other molecule that we have available currently can can do and these are intense psychedelic experiences that as it's being rolled out in the in the research and eventually into a clinical practice it's done in a very curated way in other words there's a whole process by which somebody maybe comes in for a consultation and they're described some of what we're describing right here. This is what this drug is. This is what the type of experience it can be. And they, we can spend, you know, three, four, five hours or three, four, five sessions preparing for a psychedelic journey, preparing for a, a psilocybin mushroom experience, usually in, in a, in a clinical setting, like like an office setting in the clinical trials, they have special rooms set up like a living room. So it's comfortable. Someone has the administration session or the experience session. And then there's, you know, one, two, three, four, multiple sessions of integration. So how do we, how do we understand what just happened during the psychedelic experience and spending a lot of time helping the person sort through it. So this is whole curated protocol of a particular kind of way to administer and handle, uh, a psychedelic drug like this in in a in a healthy and productive way. That's not to say that you and I both know that psilocybin mushrooms can be used recreationally for fun, for ceremony, for celebration, for ritual, for personal growth and well-being. It doesn't have to be in the context of a medical condition or a mental health condition. It can be used safely and effectively outside of a medical model. But in terms of the research, that's that's the uh, direction the the sort of more traditional Western model is going in, in in that medicalized kind of way. Well, you know, I don't I don't need magic mushrooms. 
uh, for my mental health because that's pretty pretty together probably because I've done mushrooms and it's kind of kept me healthy, I think mentally health. But I, I do use it for some as for social events because I tend to be an introvert and it allows me to open up and um, and to be uh, more receptive and, and open-minded. Um, but anyway, I, I love... I love mushrooms um, and I've taken them for years and I, um, and they've been very helpful for me. But anyway, that's neither here nor, here nor there, but it is. Um, so what advice, now look, we're trying to legalize this in, in Vermont so that we're not feeling, for me to say this on television, I, I'm not gonna come and get, get hauled out uh, and, and thrown in jail. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an understanding about this, especially in Vermont, but it needs to be legalized because right now it, it, is, it is right up there with heroin and it shouldn't be. And so talk to us about your advice for someone who wants to try magic mushrooms. What, what is your advice to them um, about around this, Rick? Well, I think it's important to do your research, so to speak. So if someone's interested in having a psychedelic experience with mushrooms or with other psychedelic drugs, frankly, you know, doing a fair amount of research and, and listening to podcasts, having conversations with people, reading some books, studying some of this, spending time making sure that you're developing enough of an awareness and building an educational background to understand what could go wrong what could be helpful, how to optimize the experience, how to minimize harms that could come from the experience, building community, being transparent with other people, people that you trust and say, hey, I'm going to do this. What do you think? Uh, you know, Finding someone maybe to hold space for you to do that in a safe and effective way. Learn from the experts, learn from the material that's out there and, and how to have a, a really good experience with it, even though at times it can, it can go sideways. The, you know, these... The, at the higher levels, some of these experiences can be quite challenging for people. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, make sure that you're aware that some of it could be difficult and having strategies there like another person available uh, to sit with you who's not on mushrooms necessarily, uh, who can you know hold your hand and walk you through something difficult that might come up. Um, so all these things are really important, which is building community, being transparent, open with the right people, reading lots of books, listening to podcasts. And, you know, I think it's something that can and ought to be used uh, in personal ways. You know, uh, how somebody decides they want to use it should be a valid way. Just waiting around for a medicalized model so that you can be prescribed a pharmaceutical version of psilocybin mushroom to be taken in an office with a licensed healthcare practitioner. Like, I get it. That is a model. That is an important model. It makes a lot of people feel safe, but that is by no means the best or only model that should be put out there, which is why we've been working in Vermont to try to at first decriminalize psilocybin so that people can grow and possess and use and share their own mushrooms for the purposes of recreation, for the purposes of celebration, for the purposes of healing, for whatever reason they want to, and not live in fear that you know the cops are going to come in and arrest you for having, you know, <laughs> four ounces of mushrooms sitting in your refrigerator. That's not that's not something people need to live with. It just doesn't make any sense. Eventually, getting to a commercial model like we finally got to with cannabis here, that would be great. So then you have you know a regulated product that you can go to the store and buy your micro doses or buy your macro dose, whatever you know amount you want. Um, that would be great. But I think starting with removing it from the list of illegal drugs in the state of Vermont uh, would be a, a really good first step. That's what we were working on this this last. Absolutely, that's, what, that's where you and I met. Was yeah. speaking out at the, in the down at the legislature and in committee. Well, you know, I agree. Nobody needs to do mushrooms and feel paranoid. That's like the last thing you want to feel. So let's get this bill passed. And I think it would have passed this year if there had been more time. Yeah. I really do. But at the end of the day, uh, I think it will pass by the end of the next session next year. Now, you were holding a a a, um, a summit, a uh, a retreat, which I got. I have my tickets to. Um, it's the Soul Quinox Summit. And it is a, a, a summit focusing on psilocybin. Um, I, I, I titled it the Psychedelic Retreat. And it's in September, I believe. And um, I'm going to be going to that. 
So with that in mind, uh, will you eventually be able to train more folks? I would like to be trained to be a magic mushroom therapist. Um, I, I personally have been helping some friends, uh, and uh, but not in a therapeutic way. But I would love to be able to get certified in Vermont. Will that ever be available to people like me who want to take it a, a step further to actually help people? I really hope so. That's part of the goal with the bill that we were working on. That it set up a psilocybin therapy advisory group of which I would hopefully be a member of. And that would set up, hopefully be able to write a report to the legislature recommending setting up a system whereby licensed or unlicensed uh, people can uh, take a training program and learn all the basics of how to hold space for people and to be able to do so in a legal and uh, safe and effective way whether it's uh, at a facility or a particular geographic location um, or in somebody's home, however that gets uh, designed, uh, that's what's happening in Oregon. Oregon passed uh, by ballot initiative. They have a model there that's being set up now and it's, it's in operation where they have licensed facilities. So specific licensed uh, brick and mortar buildings where people who are not licensed healthcare pr practitioners, but who, who have undergone a minimum of something like 80 hours of training with an experiential aspect to it. So they've done the mushrooms themselves and they have the qualifications to sit with somebody and you don't have to have a mental health diagnosis to access. In fact, that's a rule out. Like you can, you can just come for personal exploration, spiritual growth, whatever it is for creativity purposes and have a session. Uh, so I'm hoping to set up an improved version of that here. We're hoping to do that in Vermont where again, I think all paths are so important, Melinda, and the medical model is important, but so is all, so are all the models that exist outside of the medical model. So we need to be sort of all encompassing. We don't need to sort of, you know, just, you know, dig our heels into one approach only. That makes that that's not good for anybody. No, no, we have to be multifaceted. Um, and you know, a lot of my friends in my day, they went to jail and they spent time in jail for for pot and for mushrooms. And and I'm just glad as a 73 year old woman that that my generation is getting a little bit of of, of notoriety. That yeah, maybe maybe we were on to something and we didn't deserve to be thrown in jail for what we were on. So I am loving. I have a big smile on my face. I'm not on mushrooms, but I have a big smile on my face because this is important to me and it's important to my generation. So thank you for your time, Rick. Uh, it's been an incredible pleasure to get to know you. I'm so excited to be with you for three days at your summit. Um, and I hope someday that you and I can take mushrooms together and spend a day walking Mount Mansfield and just spending a lot of time together. And I look forward to that. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I would love that. That would be that would be fantastic. I think it's going to happen. So oh. let's let's keep working at it. Let's let's hope by next summer you and I can take that little uh, that little hike. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for joining us uh, with my time uh, here with with uh, with my friend. And um and I and I also want to let you know that I will see you next month. And in the meantime, have a beautiful summer. We're so glad it rained. And to you, Rick, take care. And I will see you soon. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye bye.